This is the Ideas Podcast, the show where L&D professionals discuss ideas over a nice cup of tea. Warning, other beverages may be consumed. In this episode, I chat with Terry Godfrey about his career in learning and development and how he continues to try new things and adapt to changes in our industry today. Hello, hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideas Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, with us today is a somewhat familiar face to those of us who attended the IDTX conference uh, earlier this year. It feels like many, many years ago at this point, to be honest, but it was earlier this year. I did check. Uh, with us is, uh, is Terry. Um, Terry shared with us uh, some fantastic uh, 360 degree storyline work he was doing um, earlier in the year. So we will pick up where we left off there shortly. Um, First things first, though, Terry, thank you so much for making the time to come and talk to us. Well, thank you for the invite, and I look forward to just sharing some of my experiences. So, Awesome. Really appreciate it. But um, as you know, uh, this uh, is kind of uh, a, a, a more of a social podcast, kind of camouflaged under the guise of L&D. Um, I always <laughs> like to describe the Ideas podcast as uh, it's, it's the conversations you would have down the pub after work. Um, if all you ever spoke about was learning and development, which is all I ever talk about. So I guess it is the conversations I have down the pub. But anyway, on that note, uh, what are you drinking as we uh, as we chat today? Well, actually, I'm drinking water. <laughs> Very sensible. Uh, it, it, yeah, I, I gave up uh, soda pop uh, and any of the energy drinks, which I never did. And then actually gave up um, all of that. I got enough of the beer drinking way back in college. So I just kind of outgrew <laughs> that in my younger days. So, uh, Fair enough. so I just stick to, stick to water. So. Hey, why not? That's the it's, the it's the sensible move, certainly with the temperatures we've all been getting recently, right? That's absolutely uh, of itself. That's it. Well, I am um, still in drone. This is <laughs> this is one of many podcasts being recorded today. Uh, so, for those of you who tuned into the last episode, you'll know I'm enjoying a lovely beer sent by a member of our Patreon community. Thank you once again for that. It's still very lovely. Uh, I'm still working my way through it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good one one beer and we'll get three podcasts out of it it's great it's 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 worth every bit of what you spent to, uh, to send it to the show so thank you um so without further ado let's dive into what we're here to talk about then um so i think often we get caught up in L D at that kind of um strategic level implementation we, we want to talk about strategy and grand plans and how we're gonna i don't know like conquer the universe next year or whatever it might be um but at a much more day-to-day -day level um a lot of us it's about creating great content it's about creating something that mm -hmm. works for our people that makes a real difference um and that's kind of what you were sharing with us at idtx um so kind of picking up where we left off what are you doing at the moment around that? Uh, right now, we, we we haven't stalled out any on the, the 360 images. We're kind of waiting more so for the video to come out. But we are uh, experimenting uh, with some of the um, uh, compressor stations that we have local. We you know I, I work for uh, a natural gas company that's based out of Calgary, Canada. Um, I actually I'm in the states on the east coast in the, the state of West Virginia. There's two of us here. The rest of the group that I work with, including my managers in Calgary, which is pretty good. So um, it's a good setting. But um, one of the things that we deal with here is is how things are so spread out and and remote, even out west and so there's times though where uh, individuals have to to go to a particular location and it may have been you know a while since they've been there so we're looking at utilizing the 360 imaging um, to to take uh, really decent tour type uh, photography uh, of that facility and and make it available for them to actually almost feel as if they they've walked into that facility currently working on a course right now um, uh, with uh, one of my co-workers out of canada and it's on what's called uh, orifice orphis meter plates it's it's the meter plates that's used to measure gas and so as a part of that course we we actually have um where they actually go into the facility through the 360 images and and move 
actually into the the building that has the uh, the information uh, and the plates uh, and we've done some things with some video and and then they exit that facility and that's just a small portion so uh, we're, we're blending it in with some of the existing material but I, I I'm with you Tom um, you know if we're not changing behavior if we're not moving them in a direction to be able to do things perform them better uh, then we we really don't need to be creating anything so uh and and publishing it so no absolutely and i feel like sometimes especially with a lot of the amazing technology that we've got at our disposal these days um that point can get lost um it's very easy to get excited about the latest you know insert whatever you want to talk about here kind of thing um you know whether it's you know we've got a real big focus on kind of skills-based technology now um which has the potential to be great but also the risk of Mm -hmm. technology being the solution when in actual fact we still need that human element um i think you know authoring tools has plenty of that stuff whereas a lot of whiz bang and not enough useful content out there um if you will Mm -hmm. um so i mean what's your process i guess of making that differentiation when a request comes to you or someone's asking for something in the business how do you decide whether or not it's something you know you can and should be supporting with content we have a formal process uh it's called a request for service um unfortunately and i say that wholeheartedly where our particular technical group just recently moved into hr which i'm not too fond of in terms of the type of career that I've, I've been in for the last 30 years, Mm. but we, we, we get a formal request normally from some stakeholder. It could be a stakeholder, a client, it could be an SME. Uh, A lot of those could be end up in the, being engineers could be a department head or a director. So, uh, and it's pretty flat out, um, straightforward as to requesting, uh, the most recent one I, I received, uh, said we need an LMS course. So, you know, the, the, the solution airing had already taken place before it even got to me. So my responsibility after probably uh, within the last year or so has really been, um, uh, approaching that from a from a different angle instead of beforehand it was okay <laughs> send me the material and and we'll get it out there we'll get it published get it pushed whatever but more recently within the last i'd say six months to a year um i, I initially i have a discovery call with with that individual and and within that call i do not mention anything about a course uh, job age videos. I don't mention anything. I just want to find out exactly where this request is coming from. Is there a need? Is there a gap? That sort of thing. Um, for, I, I do know a lot of the SMEs. I've worked with them over the last three or four years. So that relationship's been built. They know where I'm coming from. My background from, as a technical trainer in another gas company for eight years, they know where I stand. Uh, you know, I have some experience uh, and, and some knowledge, uh, you know, about this industry. So they're very comfortable with that. So once I get that particular information like the, the most recent one um, I kind of pondered over it and and really decided that a course was not needed so then it was a matter of going back to those subject matter experts uh, and trying to convince them but once I got back to them um, I was able to dig out some more information and in all reality a course is needed mm-hmm. uh, but but it but approaching it from a different way so um, I remember, uh, I think in, in, uh, Kim Tooney, uh, the conversation you had with her, one of the things that you had mentioned that you all had started doing was, was, uh, approaching the users, uh, the yeah. people in the field without even talking with the SMEs. And I began doing that myself, which I, before I even speak with the SME, I talk with the, the users. I work in a field office, so it's not difficult for me to go round up some individuals that's actually going to be getting their hands on this uh, and find out some more details. And then I go into the conversation or the kickoff meeting or the discovery meeting, at least having a good understanding of what they really need 
based upon <laughs> those individuals out there. So uh, from that point, it's just it, it's a matter of uh, staying in, in communication. We we set um, uh, due deadlines. Uh, we we set uh, normally a, like a due date, and then what we'll end up doing is uh, what we call a publish date and a push date. We just recently, as a corporation, changed LMS systems. Uh, and went to work day okay. and um, yeah it, it it I think it's going to be a better system but it's really pushing back it's pushing onto the the workforce the employees um, a lot of responsibilities and we have um, a very older generation of technicians here in the states that uh, they just want to come and move gas. They, they weren't hired to learn. <laughs> so, you know, to, to take uh, 140, e, you know, e-learning modules every, you know, year. So, uh, you know, we do fight that or battle that. Um, and I've been there, so I can sympathize and empathize with them, uh, which is a benefit. So Definitely. And it, funnily enough, I think actually, to, in my experience anyway, um, my drive to speak to the end users first actually started in exactly that kind of environment where I knew I was going to be asked to create content or create some kind of um, intervention or support for people who mm-hmm. had 30, 40 years experience, um, you know, laying, laying pipes and cables and digging holes in mm-hmm. streets and doing stuff safely. Um, and there I was going to be in my kind of early 20s trotting up going, now listen to me because I'm going to train you. Um, mm-hmm. That's probably not going to go down too well. As you say, there's a, you know, for, for better or worse, it's human to say, well, hang on a minute. I've got all this experience. Just leave me alone to do my job. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And I found engaging with that audience and almost acknowledging the look, I want to speak to you because, you know, we may have SMEs and stakeholders but you're the boots on the ground. You do this day in, day out. No one knows the job better than you. And I think the thing that always sort of never fails to surprise me, even now in every organization that I work with, the stakeholder and SME perception of what's happening in the business is wildly different (laughs) to what's actually happening in the business. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, how how have you you found that and how have you kind of... um, bridge that gap because i know it, it can certainly be quite challenging i've found one of the things that 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 i how i approach the smes that i work with and we work with a lot of smes in a lot of different areas um uh, you know we we still support the the um the corporate side through safety um, i mean it's everything now i'm more of a blue collar type uh e-learning designer I, actually it's something i've even thought about creating some kind of a podcast mm-hmm. called blue collar podcasting or something i don't know but one of the things that i do is approach my smes under with the understanding that they are presenting to me in the context of of what they know, not from necessarily the experience. Uh, and it, they're not really presenting to me the content. They're, re, they're presenting to me their context of what is actually needed, uh, good or bad. Sometimes it, it's not so good. Uh, you, you may have uh, the, the lowest um, SME on the totem pole that got pegged for, you know, to, to create this course uh, with, you know, less than a year of experience in this industry. Right. And they're coming to me, uh, you know, with, with all of this content. Uh, and, and again, uh, I'm a very, very relational type individual uh, when it comes to working with uh, especially field technicians. I get in a little trouble with uh, kind of the white collar type people but because <laughs> I speak my piece. But um, but I think that comes from an experience side. But um, but yeah, they the SMEs come from, um, uh, I, I work with them in the, in the sense that that I, I try to find out where they're coming from, from their context of what is needed. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, your um, sharing that one day kind of changed that around uh, to where now I'm comparing the two with, with the, u- with the end, the end uh, user, I think is what you referred to them as. Um, you know, we, we used to say the learner and I'm like, no, they're not learners. They're technicians that are here to move gas. They're not learners. They were not hired to be learners. And, you know, now that we're in HR, um, 
you know, I, ha- I have to kind of mince my words a little bit because of, you know, the HR side of this industry is more from an educational standpoint, the old school, uh, yeah. you learn things, you take a test and then you move on. Um, what we need to do and what I'm trying to do is, is, uh, create experiences to where they, they are able to, um, understand the process, but it carries through from, from one job to the next. My goal is, is, is to create e-learning that they want to take, <laughs> not just take to get off their learning plans. And, uh, we've had an awful lot of that, unfortunately, um, in the industry that I work in. So, no, and I think it's, I think it's true in most organizations, um, that I would say 90% of training is created because, well, we've got to have training on this because, well, we just do. And therefore it gets created with mm-hmm. that mindset behind it. But I also think mm-hmm. there's sometimes, I think a bit of a, mis- a misinterpretation, sorry, um, of what someone enjoying training is going to be. Because I think often we fall into the trap of thinking, well, if someone's enjoying training, they're going to be nonstop laughing or they're going to do it in their spare time. It's going to be the thing they want to do before anything else. Um, so when you talk about people kind of enjoying learning, what what exactly are you looking to create for them? Uh, you know, we use all the bells and whistles. We're we're really big on articulate that whole suite. Um, you know, the storyline. Um, but what I try to do, yes, I use the drag and drop and all of that. But once again, trying to create an experience and, and this course that I, I, I referenced to early on about the Orifice meters, mm-hmm. uh, th- that's one of the things that we're actually doing in this particular course to where uh, when the technicians log into this course, it, it's more of a, of a journey of, of going into it. It's taking into consideration their existing level of knowledge concerning this topic, their experience level. Uh, Yes, there are some things that that we, I hate to say, force feed them to take, not necessarily take, but read. So the enjoyment is is when they leave there, uh, you know, the, the, the highest accolade that I could receive is like I actually learned something. Uh, and so that to me is the, the joy behind it or the enjoyment of, you know, I'm not, I'm not big on gamification. I know that's a big old huge word out there about including, you know, I don't, I don't include the bingo games and the word searches and all of that in any of my e-learning courses. Um, I just, I, sometimes we just let it speak for, for what it's worth, um, Long story short, one of the first things that I had to build about three years ago is working with a gas storage director who was involved with writing the, the rewriting procedures for OSHA. And so he wanted 26 courses created on this new procedure. And so he had all of these PowerPoint presentations that he was that he was feeding me and the smallest one I, I i kid you not was about 65 slides and each one had uh was full of text no graphics it had stuff pasted and so one of the things that it it was a really big paradigm shift for me as a as a designer and a developer because i'm <laughs> like this, this could be a royal nightmare for for the user for the person but it's going to kill me <laughs> you know putting it together so uh i i went to the director and he was very cooperative and i said hey I, you know out of this what do they actually need to know in order to perform this and that narrowed it down to, to, to less than half of what he supplied, but he still wanted that additional information in there. So we created uh, opportunities for them. If they wanted to go take a look at it, they could. If they didn't, that's fine. Um, you know, they're adults. They're not children. This is not the school system to where you will learn this. But um, that was a very successful endeavor, 26 of them in one year. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it saved the company somewhere around $300,000, um, internally, which I, <laughs> yeah. I saw none. I think I got a $500 spotlight award or something. So, uh, but, uh, you know, the recognition was to know yeah. that, that it, uh, we, we succeeded. So 
I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I, I think it's it's not so much enjoyment, I guess, or having fun. It's a matter of adding value um, to to where they stand existing with their knowledge level and skill level. Yeah, no, I, I, and that's kind of what I was touching on because I think it's with enjoyment. I think we tend to jump to that extreme end of it's got to be funny, and a, a game is a prime example. We love uh, just the word gamification. It sounds daft. I'm not convinced it's a real word. Uh, I'm fairly certain it was created by a marketing department somewhere. <laughs> um, but um, uh, more importantly to me, when I think about, I want my or it's same with engagement, I suppose. When I talk about those kind of things, what I want is it to be in context and relevant to mm-hmm, the learner. Absolutely. Because I don't think, at a human level, when you learn something, it is an enjoyable experience. Mm-hmm. We all get that, right? Whether it's and you broke something at home or something broke at home, um, and you've found a YouTube video and you figure out how to fix it and you succeed, it's a great feeling. And I think actually that feeling of enjoyment if you can get that in your learners as you say that accolade of i learned something Mm -hmm. sounds simple but actually how much workplace learning have you attended where you've left gone yep learned nothing at all what a waste of my time um Mm -hmm. and i think that's why when we see that hesitance around do i have to do this do i really need to learn anything more i think that's where that comes from Mm -hmm. is the fact that they've gone to so much training and taken nothing from it they just perceive it as dead time well i you know to to be honest with you and tell you a little bit about our our company uh, when a new technician comes on board and 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 again the the favorite words is i kid you not a hundred and twenty e-learning courses are automatically assigned to them um and that in and of itself just completely destroys them uh, from a from a learning standpoint because and I've shared this with with my manager uh, and the and the, the people that I work with and we have a really good staff and a really good manager um, I think they're really good because they're all in Calgary but and I'm in West Virginia so. <laughs> <laughs> but but I shared, I said, you know, when they see that, their their number one goal is to get that down to zero. It's not to learn anything. It's to go in and knock one off, to knock this one off, because they're out there moving gas. And, and so, you know, if, if those are uh, laborious and, and not put together well and don't add value, it just makes things even worse. Um, you, you, you made a statement in, in one of your other uh, podcasts. I think it was with, um, Heidi Kirby. You, you were talking about being up in front of a classroom, uh, or, or mm-hmm. teaching, which, which then, uh, gave you, um, more of a, a, a leg up on, on the ability to create things. I actually started out as a school teacher in the early eighties. I, I grew up and wanted to be a football coach and a phys ed teacher. Um, and I grew up in Southern part of West Virginia, so I didn't want to be in the coal mines. So that was my ticket out of there. Um, I did, I, I was able to get that. So I actually started teaching and for three years I coached high school football and we had a local chemical plant here uh, which was booming back in the the mid 80s um, and was offered a position as a chemical process operator um, which the thing that lured me there was the money it wasn't that I was going to have to turn wrenches because I had no idea you know but spent four years doing that and then was asked to be in their training department that had just started a year before uh, in my third year and spent 15 years there uh, as a training administrator. Now, we did a lot of safety teaching, a lot of training, but part of my responsibility was to, was to administrate the, the qualification process for our operators. Um, spent 20 years total there, was downsized, and then went to work for a, a natural gas company and was actually a technical trainer teaching skills in compressor uh, measurement, uh, corrosion. So from there, I moved over to an instructional design position uh, where I'm at now. Uh, with that background, which has been nothing but a total blessing, uh, you know, uh, I have SMEs just hand, you know, tell me what they need and they just get out of the way we put, I, I'm a big, I'm a big, uh, person on prototyping. Uh, I like to get 
them something that looks really good to the point to where they have a good understanding of what where it's going to go and and then you know they've got full-time jobs uh, you know they have day jobs and uh, the least amount of uh uh, burden that I can put on them, the more cooperative they're going to be. So uh, I've had great success with that. Um, I'll prototype something, give it to them. So the review process is normally about one or two, maybe three maximum times, and then we're off and running to the next one. But, um, you know, my background has really enabled me to be successful. So long story short, I've actually been in this field since 1991. Um, so I'm, I'm one of the old school guys in the group that I'm in. Um, you know, we've I got all these 30 year olds and I'm soon to be 63. So, <laughs> so. but I, you know, I, I find it so interesting because I, it's kind of one of the things that I, when I was chatting to some people the other day about becoming an instructional designer and a lot of them, um, you know, there's nothing wrong. I don't think we want knowing that you want to go into L&D and you want to be an ID. That's that's great. If that's definitely what you want to do and you genuinely know what an instructional designer actually does, because it's not just sit and make e-learning, as we all know, mm-hmm. unfortunately, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a much easier quite job? A few, than yeah, 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 there's <laughs> quite a few other hats that you, you kind of put on. So That's it. Um, but I was kind of saying the, the, the one experience that I wish all these people could get is a year, two years, maybe three years of standing up and delivering training to rooms of people, Mm -hmm. especially onboarding training. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like it's, first of all, it's a baptism of fire of, do you actually understand learning? Do, can you get your head around what that process looks like and what works and what doesn't? And you get very real, very immediate feedback. Cause if someone doesn't get it, they're going to ask. Um, if I I feel like if you dive straight into the world of digital, you never get that immediate feedback. You can maybe get, I mean, I chatted with someone the other day, they, they were very honest and said, look, I've been making e-learning for five years. I don't really know whether or not I'm any good at it. Mm, um, wow. I'm still employed. Mm-hmm. I said, but can I guarantee that all my courses are really effective from a learning perspective? No. Mm-hmm. So I've got no data to back that up. So I've got data that the company collects on hours delivered and general performance stuff. So, but can I say that is because of my understanding of learning? No, not really. Um, and we kind of chat about that is exactly the experience that they wish they'd had is standing in front of a room of people and say, and seeing what works, getting a genuine organic feel for it. I don't feel like there is uh, a kind of alternative to that. I've never found another way mm-hmm. of getting that experience. Well, I, I, I know when I was working for the other company as a tech, as a technical trainer uh, with my primary focus uh, in the compression side, um, mm. but I also was, was still designing and, and developing and publishing e-learning courses as well. But, you know, it wasn't uncommon for every other week me to be in front of uh, technicians and, uh, you know, teaching them about operator qualification. So at some point, you know, the, you know, I was uh, asked to put together uh, some training material on uh, training out uh, or actually changing out the valves on a compressor. And so uh, to, to do that, um, I actually went out in the field uh, in, down in the southern part of the state. These guys, uh, I didn't necessarily grow up with them but we knew each other from because of where, where we grew up and actually turned wrenches with them for four days um, and if I could I do it now no <laughs> I mean but but it, it, you know the thing the thing they bought into me when I was even willing to do that so if I was standing in front of a classroom they didn't hesitate to kind of let me know that what I just said really wasn't the right way. And I was able to kind of move it into their lap and get them more involved and say, well, you know, um, then share with us, uh, you know, where was I wrong with this? Because they knew I didn't, I, I had an operator compressor station. So, um, it, yeah, that's, you, you can't do without that. I think there's so much benefits. And unfortunately, and I say this, you know, um, our, our, our instructional designers out in Calgary, uh, and, and I'm not saying this to be bad or, say anything uh negative about them but none of the ones out there have been in the field 
uh, and they're designing courses for the field. Um, you know, they're, and so, uh, you know, they, they have their hands tied a little bit. It's a little bit more difficult. Um, it's a little easier for them to put a next button, which, um, you know, that's, that's another pet peeve of mine. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, th- I think it's interesting, isn't it? Cause I, I always, I always remember that one of my favorite managers that I ever worked for before going out on my own was, um, it was a fa- fantastic lady. And she was very adamant when I started on the team, before you do anything, you're going to go and do the job that you're going to be training people to do. Mm-hmm. And the first week of my paid time working in that business in the L&D team was an actual fact spent doing a little bit of time in the call center and going out to the field mm-hmm. and going out to different places and going, oh, this is what our people do. And then coming back and going, OK, so now look at the induction training and tell us what's wrong with it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I, and you actually can that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, when I, when I was at the, when I first started in the chemical business, I spent four years as an operator mm-hmm. on shift. You know, I mean, we, we moved chemicals, pumps, valves, everything. So, you know, everything, uh, and, and actually enjoyed it, learned an awful lot. So when I moved into that training group, we had a, uh, an apprenticeship program that all of our operators went through. It was through the federal government and, and it was really, really good. Uh, we had, we were tied in with a local college. You could, uh, uh, complete this apprenticeship program, take, um, uh, I think it was seven classes and end up with an associate degree. So, um, but my background one of my degrees is in science. So I also taught the sciences of the apprenticeship program. So, you know, to know and to have that experience is just, uh, so valuable. It's just, I, I can't stress it. So, but unfortunately, I mean, we, you know, we've had a uh, tremendous exit of school teachers in this country and your country. <laughs> I mean, and oh, yeah. and I think, you know, and I'll just be very honest with you, and I think we can do that. And if you don't, you know, I, I think some of them are being misled. I, I think, uh, you yeah. know, uh, tremendously in terms of, you know, uh, go online, get these th- this experience in, in terms of learning how to do this, learn how to do that get these certificates and make six figures. And, um, you know, um, I, I, yeah. I'll be very honest with you. I mean, I get compensated very well, but the big thing with me right now is I, I would go out and branch out as a freelancer tomorrow. The big thing is insurance. Uh, at my age, it, it is just astronomical. And I've got a wife, she's retired. Um, and, and neither one of us are sick, but you know, uh, we're at that age that it, it could be right around the corner. So, you know, that's one thing, but I don't think here in the state of West Virginia that I would come close to making six figures as an instructional designer, you know, uh, yeah, I, I do feel like that, that particular um, thing. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of different places have pr- either promised it or heavily suggested it in different ways. And I do just feel like it's, first of all, they're not giving out jobs. Right. Oh. You know, it's anyone that kind of says you'll get a salary of, unless they're the ones hiring you, they got nothing to do with that. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and certainly, I mean, like I've been, I've, I've not been in the industry like a huge amount of time. I'm coming up on a decade here. But I'm nowhere near six figures. And in all likelihood, I will never, if I'm in this industry until the day I retire, I will probably never have a six-figure salary. I run my own business at this point. Right. You know, yeah, absolutely. It's not, it's not a multinational thousand-employee business, you know. But there's enough of us whereby, you know, I think a lot of people would expect there to be that kind of salary. There is money in L and D, but I, I, it, I wouldn't suggest joining the industry if money is your, um, your primary concern in a job. If you just want to make money, there are much more lucrative businesses to go into that are far less demanding. Oh, absolutely, and you know, um, you know, you know, I'm not going to deny that I haven't sat down and and really kind of, um, I don't want to say analyzed. 
uh, a move such as that nature of nature but you know when i start looking uh all of the tools that we have i mean uh, the camera that i'm looking at the microphone the headset the computers the monitors the desk uh software we're we've got brand new um, um computers on order right now that uh, have you know terabyte hard drives i mean just all of that's supplied for us you know, as a corporation, uh, my big thing is retirement, you know, fantastic for one. So there's a lot of other things involved. Um, but I will tell you that, that I literally, after 31 years, 91, I have literally the best job that I've ever had in my career right now. It, uh, I, I live 15 minutes from here. We work a hybrid schedule. Uh, if I want to work from home on the days that I need to come in, I can. Um, I've got a great coworker. I work in a field office. I, I can wear blue jeans, tennis shoes, and a t-shirt to work. So there's a <laughs> lot of lot of things, you know. Um, you know, when you branch out on your own, like like yourself, there's so much that I don't have to worry about, yeah. which enables me to be better at what I enjoy doing. Um, I saw a quote the other day from uh, uh, Dirty Jobs. I don't know if you all get that over there. It's Mike Rowe here. He he actually goes out and actually performs these dirty jobs that nobody wants to do out in the and they videotape it. It's a reality show. If you ever go out on the internet, you can just call his name's Mike Rowe. It's called Dirty Jobs. It's 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 worth watching. But he said a quote. He said, you know, don't he he, he said don't pursue your passion. Bring it with you. And, and I kind of like that, uh, to the point to where, you know, I'm not pursuing something. I'm already there. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, you know, uh, have, have you reached the pinnacle of what you set out to do? And I said, one, I didn't set out to do this, set out to be a school teacher and coach football. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, if you want to ask me what I'm doing right now, absolutely. Um, have no desire to be a manager. I have no desire to move down that realm. Um, at one time, yeah, but uh, my wife was a principal and a vice principal for 33 years, and um, according to her, I could never be a manager. <laughs> so, you know, so I didn't have the patience <laughs> for it. So, uh, it's, I, I, you know, I get that. Yeah, everybody does not think like you, and everybody does not do things like you. But uh, uh, but it's people like you, Tom, that 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 are on the airways and that are in writings and stuff that I think a lot of the new people need to latch on to. And, and, and I don't think you're out there trying to be any type of role model. What I like about your shows and your writings is, uh, is, is you're just blatantly honest and, and you speak from your heart, um, and from what experience you have. And, it makes me think, I mean, even with the years that I have, and, and it's changed my perception and, and direction uh, tremendously within the last six to eight months and even a year. So, uh, uh, oh, well, thank you. That's very, very, very kind of you. We don't, uh, <laughs> we don't do a lot of that on this show, but, um, but it's funny before we started, cause I'm aware we're coming up on the end of our, of our time slot, but um, before we started, we touched on the fact that, you know, quite often when someone's been in the industry a very long time, they very much, I don't know, get a little trapped in the, this is how I do things. Um, I have reached the, I don't know, the pinnacle of my career and therefore I'm done adopting new ways of doing things. Uh, and you were saying you're kind of at the polar opposite of that, which I found really, really interesting and really exciting. Well, just recently, uh, I, I would say within the last year, um, you know, I, I don't set New Year's resolutions, but I set some goals this year. And uh, one of the things and some of the goals were to do what I'm doing right now, which uh, I'm very thankful um, to, 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 to share some of my experience, uh, not necessarily my knowledge, but more so my experience. There's a lot of knowledge out there. But within the last year, I journeyed into the AR realm and took an AR our class uh and absolutely loved it you know and i was the grandfather on that cohort i mean everybody on there was in their <laughs> early 20s and you know they're probably saying what's this old guy doing on absolutely had a blast now you know we had to turn in assignments and one of my assignments was a was an ar uh, augmented reality on the the walking dead 
Dead, which is a, a show over here. I don't know if they have it in the UK. So I'm yeah. a big fan of that. So um, I, I created a, a Walking Dead with a quiz from the early days. So uh, here recently, I, I went through um, uh, Chris Carroll's um, uh video for learning uh six week cohort i want to i want to learn more um constantly on linkedin learning uh learning adobe premiere adobe photoshop um actually j went out and watched uh your three tutorials on uh what is it is it a um Adapt. A, adapt, yeah. yeah. Now the thing that you know, I, I'm still learning from a from a technical. When you started talking mm -hmm. uh, about servers, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm not giving up on it, uh, but uh, I like that software. I'm like, wow, this this is some good stuff. I mean, uh, Rise is good, and of course they just made it so wonderful here recently with all of that pretty stuff that they published, but. Um, you know, what you shared that, that is some really good software. Uh, and, and uh, I'm not done with that yet. Um, went through a course, uh, here with, uh, Luke Hobson on, uh, working mm -hmm. with, um, uh, and collaborating with SME. So here I am 30, 31 years into this and, and learning about working with SMEs, but we can always be better and always get better. Um, and some people was like, I'm already there. I don't, you know, what do I need? What else do I need to learn? Hey, you know, the world that we're in right now, I can assure you is totally different than what it was when I was 25 years old. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I can, I can honestly say in 1992, I saw in a computer magazine that some guy left in my office and it was talking about computer based training. And I looked at the guys that I worked with and I said, this is where this is going to be going in the future. And so from that point forward, I just kind of, uh, uh, kind of pursued that love learning, uh, love reading, uh, that sort of thing. Um, used to love playing golf, but you know, you blow out knees and all kinds of good things and you just can't do stuff like that too much anymore. So. Nice. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's, it's, it's really refreshing. I think regardless of how long you've been in the industry, I think it's very, it's really quite challenging to continually embrace not knowing everything. I feel there's an urge to be an expert now. Everyone oh, wow. wants to be seen yes. as an expert or yes. be an expert. And, you know, whether you've got 10 minutes experience or, you know, 40 years, I always kind of think, I don't know, I, I never want to be an expert. I Because there is always going to be something. You, yeah. I don't think you can really master a subject because as soon as you have mastered it, something new will come up or a new interpretation will arrive or whatever that might be. So I think it's uh, not only is it great professionally, I think it's at a human level. It's a really mm -hmm. healthy way to view yourself and life and mm -hmm. everyone else around you. Because if there's always somewhere thing you can be learning, then that's true of everyone else as well. Mm -hmm. I think it naturally makes us a bit more generous towards others. Whereas yes. some, someone yes. says something, you think, oh, that's a daft thing to say. Well, mm -hmm. you never said anything a bit daft. I know yeah. I have. <laughs> Heck, I, I, I've regularly done it on the internet for everyone to enjoy and for it to be immortalized. Hey, well, I, I enjoy. I mean, I, I actually stand up and applaud sometimes. I'm like, oh, wow, I wish I had the nerve to say that. But uh, but I've been very no, blessed. I, I will say this to, throughout my career, uh, especially with my wife of 38 years. So, uh, she's supported me, um, in, in learning new things and, and encourages it. Um, I've had managers that I, you know, in my earlier years that, that, uh, put me out there to learn new things that, uh, pushed me, uh, made me uncomfortable. Um, and now I've got, you know, a, a coworker that's right across the hall that's constantly coming over and saying, Hey, I want to show you something. And I mean, he's teaching me things in, in Photoshop where he, he's a photographer. He has a side hustle type mm -hmm. thing. And so he's teaching me how to, uh, uh take a, a photograph of a technician out on a right of way. Uh, in a field and uh, what we do is we, we just, you know, do things with the background and make him stand out in color and people in our courses, some of these technicians, I mean, we'll get phone calls and they'll, they'll be like, 
you know, the, uh, uh, in that module, the thing that caught my attention was the graphics that, that you know, and, and it, I could relate to them. And, and so, yeah, I mean, we're constantly, you know, handed stuff and, some, and told to make this pretty, <laughs> you know, irregardless of whether it adds any value or not, just make it pretty. And, uh, and I'm very big on making things pretty, but I also want to make it, as you said, in the context of, of adding value to that, those individuals that's going to be taking that so you know my big push now is um, uh, if it's not a course um, I'm trying to get up the nerve to just kind of say listen you know we do not and I, I've done that here recently we don't we don't need to build build a course you know and I had a director look and said well you know we, we just need to address this issue whatever you come up with, up with I trust and and they left and I'm like yeah, that's what we want. <laughs> we're yeah. we're the experts in this area, or the um, the subject matter uh, experts. Yeah. So uh, so when you get a director at that level, but once again, and and people have to realize this. Um, uh, I've known this individual for about six years, and so there's been a relationship built, and she knows where I stand, and she knows that I have the best interest of the receivers of this material at heart. Uh, uh, I tell the, the people I work with constantly, we are not building these courses for ourselves. We're not built. We, we shouldn't be building them for an SME, you know, and so uh, uh, and it's still an uphill battle um, and uh, we'll see. We're, we'll get there. We're getting there slowly, but uh, um, I'm impatient. So. <laughs> 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 and that's standard for all of us, isn't it? We all wish we were there. But I think making progress, to be honest, is is the best any of us can ever achieve. It's never going to be Absolutely. final state for any of us. It's always going to be, you know, whether it's, you know, in my case, moving to another organization to help them start making the progress. Or if you're in the same organization, you, you just got to focus on moving the dial until mm -hmm. then you hand it off to someone else. It's, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's kind of the best way to be, but, um, we are coming up on the end of our time. I just want to finish up with one last question. That I'm asking everyone at the end of these episodes, which is right now, when you look at the L and D industry, the whole field, what do you see and get really excited about and want to see more of? And what do you see that is maybe a little bit more concerning or that you're not sure about right now? Well, I think uh, a little bit more concerned with I think I think the shiny new toys that seem to be coming out um, every you know so often we we we, we uh, are choosing to not stick with something that's working. We, we see something that that allows us to do something a little bit different or new. Um, and, and, and that's a concern. I mean, there's just software one after another coming out. Um, uh, so that, that's part of the thing. Um, but as far as what's exciting is, is, um, the opportunities, I think, uh, to, um, create performance and behavioral changes still exist. We, we, we've not even come close to addressing that side of this business. And I think there's, there's just opportunities uh, galore uh, for us to make a difference in that area. Uh, and I'm talking about behavior change, not necessarily knowledge. I think there's just way, way too much knowledge dumping out there. Uh, we, we're just throwing stuff around uh, and, and calling it training when in reality it's, it's, it's might be good information, but it's not training. So. Fantastic. No, I think, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point there to kind of go away and think about because it's, uh, it's certainly, I'm sure we've all seen plenty of knowledge dumps out there disguised as e-learning or training um and it's uh it, it's a challenge right it's a challenge mm -hmm. to get rid of the existing ones and not create more at the same time but um thank you so much for taking oh, the time you. to appear on the show um if people want to get in touch and continue the conversation where's the best place to uh to contact you i think it's uh, out on linkedin um you know i have a but you know I, i'm not a, a poster for lack of better words uh okay I, I think i got a notice the other day it said you made your fourth post and i was like i did so um but that's that's something that um um you know i'm going to begin doing uh it, it's a part of uh of of the change that that i'm pushing myself to do to to offer up some experience out there but that's the best way is uh just through through that type of messaging 
um, and um, uh, if they want to look at our our company, which I don't I don't necessarily need to mention it, but um, uh, you know they could find me through there. So fantastic yeah no um and we'll uh, we'll make sure there's a link to uh to terry's linkedin in the description of this episode i'll also include a link to the idtx um session oh, yeah. you did uh, for us so people can see that work it is a, a really interesting use of um 360 and storyline which up until that point i'll be honest i had only ever seen used with some really terrible gimmicks that kind of served no purpose um it was the first example where i went okay yeah i can see why this is actually adding value from an end learn an end user perspective um you know it, this has a purpose this use of it rather than just being isn't this impressive look what we can do um, well, I, I, is, I learned so know. much. Uh, that experience was just so valuable. I'm actually do, redoing that again here in August Brilliant. for our, our state local ATD uh, uh, lunch and learn. Um, and so uh, I've kind of changed it around, but it's really encouraging to hear what you're saying. Uh, because that is, that's the intent, um, is, is to um, uh, create an experience, not just an event. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Ideas Podcast. Before you go, please do let us know what you're taking away from this conversation and how you'll put it into action in the comments below. If you're watching on YouTube, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons as it really helps us out.